Hello, good morning. Um, I think we're live. Uh, my name is Benjamin J. Butler, a uh, futurist from Hong Kong. Uh, today I'm joined by Nina Angelovska, the former minister, uh, finance minister for Macedonia. Uh, my friend Kishore Mabubani, a professor uh, and distinguished fellow from uh, NUS, and has just published an amazing book you can see in, lurking in the background as China won. Uh, and uh, Madam President uh, Vira VK Friberga, the former president of uh, Latvia. Um, we also are due to be joined uh, by uh, Francisco Sanchez, the Under Secretary of Commerce for the United States uh, in the Obama uh, administration, uh, and uh, Chairman uh, N. K. Singh, uh, who's Chairman of the uh, Indian Finance uh, Commission. Uh, we've gathered some uh, extraordinary people from all over the world, and um, um, uh, the time zones are all over the place. So uh, I, hopefully uh, our additional panelists will uh, uh, connect in shortly. Um, well, we've kind of maybe we've bitten off more, more than we can chew in this session. Uh, the idea was to uh, grapple with the question um, are we a, a, an evolution, a evolutionary turning point uh, in the, the history of uh, humanity? Um, 2020 has been quite a, an extraordinary year, especially as a futurist. Uh, almost a, a, a science fiction year with um, kicking off with uh, uh, plagues of uh, locusts uh, across uh, Africa, uh, of course, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, economic crisis, and uh, of course, the intensification uh, of conflict between uh, the USA and China, maybe uh, um, bordering, bordering on a, a new Cold War. Uh, alternatively, um, my theory is that, um, um, using the words um, of the, the late futurist, um, uh, an amazing fu female futurist um, who, who pa sadly passed away last uh, year, uh, Barbara Marx uh, Hubbard, who said uh, the crisis is 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 our birth. Uh, and she she uh, like like me, she was a student of evolutionary theory and and thought that um, that uh, when we think of evolution most people look backwards and see it as a historical phenomenon, whereas actually we have the potential to evolve ourselves. Uh, and uh, is the current crisis uh, an opportunity uh, or a catalyst to accelerate some of the, the green shoots uh, that one can see in, in terms of uh, system changes, new technologies, uh, new ways of, uh, of doing things? Um, in in ev ev evolution suggests uh, that there's this impulse uh, in nature and within, within within all of us for greater complexity, diversity, creativity, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it, it's a big, um, a, a kind of a big topic, but um, uh, everyone has their their own areas of um, um, expertise. And I I just thought we kick off um the first um round with just your first first take uh on uh, on the question of do, do you think we're um at this uh an evolutionary moment um and um are you positive about the future and, and the next uh decade um um professor uh Mabibani, would you like to kick off uh yes uh thank you thank you very much uh for inviting me, I mean, call me Kishore Benjamin. <laughs> uh, the, we, we are clearly at some major turning point in human history. And one small point I want to make is that we've probably seen more change in the last 30 years than we have in the past 300 years or 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. And in the past 30 years, there have been at least three big shifts uh, that have happened that we refuse to deal with in a, in a fundamental fashion. And until we deal with them, we're going to have this anxiety that we feel today uh, about the future. So the first big shift, of course, the one that is, is sort of something I've written about quite often is that we, we've ended an uh, artificial 200-year period of Western domination of world history. 
And I always emphasize that from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So the past 200 years when Europe and North America ran the world was an aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end. And today in purchasing power parity terms, the number one economy is China, number two is United States, number three is India, number four is Japan. So clearly power is shifting back to Asia. That's the first tectonic shift that's happening. The second is that as a result of growing globalization, uh, interdependence, essentially we have really nearly created what I call one world. And to explain the one world, I just use a very simple boat metaphor, which is that in the past when 7.7 .7 billion people live in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats with captains and crews of governments taking care of each boat. Now, as a result, the world having shrunk, effectively, the 193 countries are no longer separate boats. They are separate cabins on the same boat. But the problem with our global boat is that you have governments taking care of each cabin <laughs> and no one taking care of the global boat as a whole. And that also explains why the world is adrift and why we feel that we're not, in a sense, handling this problem. So that's the second big shift that's happened. These are already two big ones. But the third big one, which is, is in a sense, in some ways, a consequence or related to the second one, which is suddenly the new wave of problems coming at us can no longer be solved by one country alone. And exhibit A, of course, is COVID-19, right? COVID-19 actually confirmed that we are all now passengers on the, on the same boat. And we can only do it with it. We come together. You can't lock up your cabin. You won't escape COVID-19. In the same way, global warming, the big message that global warming is sending to us is that we live in really one tiny imperial planet. Again, no country can solve it. We have to come together. But unfortunately, and this is where all these three are linked, the three tectonic shifts are linked, because to, to solve the third set of problems, you first have to handle the power transition and give greater say for to Asian countries and global governance institutions. A lot of resistance to that. And then the second part, clearly, you have to strengthen institutions of global governance. And guess what? At a time when we should be strengthening the World Health Organization, the United States leaves the World Health Organization. At a time when we should be strengthening the World Trade Organization, the United States is trying to paralyze the, United, uh, the World Trade Organization. That can go on. So clearly, we now have to change our mindsets, deal with these three big shifts, and then we can handle the 21st century. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's a great uh, opening uh, statement. Uh, uh, Madam President, um, what, what's your, your take on the, the central question? Do you think we're at this uh, evolutionary moment? Well, to take evolution in its literal sense, I think we're constantly being in a state of evolution. And as you know, uh, the big debate between evolutionists over the past century and a half has been about uh, the question, does it happen in leaps and bounds, or is there such a thing as gradual change? Yeah. Uh, uh, we have just heard uh, a wonderful e exposition of, of how change has been accelerating. I believe it will continue accelerating, and the COVID uh, pandemic is going to speed up this rate of change. Um, but we have to distinguish two, two types of evolution, the literal evolution of uh, us as biological beings, as a biological species, and, uh, and the cultural evolution. The two are intimately linked. Um, what have we discovered in the, in the last decades of science? Um, we know that uh, humans are the most helpless beings at birth among any any species on the planet. There are others, but, but we're just about um, obviously unable to survive at birth. We have a long period of, of growth and maturation needing support. During that period, um, a lot can go wrong, and we see that everywhere, especially with children in refugee camps and in, in deprived areas and so on. There are critical periods uh, for uh, the brain to develop its capacities. And they depend on feedback from the environment. Uh, a child growing up in an inadequate environment is going to be in some sense an inadequate adult. 
But the other thing we have discovered is that the uh, this helplessness being compensated by this fantastic um, malleability, flexibility of the human brain uh, has opened up potentials uh, for growth and change uh, that were not uh, understood uh, 100 or even 50 years ago. Uh, the, uh, the conviction was the intellectual cap capacities of a human being stopped at one average at 18. We've now discovered that by learning how to learn, and regardless of what is being learned during the early years of life, one learns how to learn. One establishes algorithms for acquiring new information. And the more new information one acquires, the more, if you like, the capacity of the brain uh, is increased in terms of functionality. But not just that. Uh, it seems that even neurologically, uh, brain cells uh, do not just keep popping off, uh, you know, so many thousands a second as I used to be taught uh, as a student. No, uh, there is a there is a flexibility, and uh, even though uh, old age, the biological clock, um, the the diseases of old age do catch up with us inevitably at some point, um, the uh, flexibility, uh, the interaction with the environment is much, much bigger than we thought before. But if we rely more and more on artificial intelligence, if humans become more and more passive, they use artificial intelligence and technology not just as a prosthesis to improve, say, their functioning, their walking, their thinking, their creating. But if they become passive, they step back, they forget how to learn or to learn how to learn. Well, then, then degeneration is absolutely one of the possibilities, not to mention physiologically, the poisoning of the planet, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat, all being contaminated with cancerogens and all sorts of junk uh, and harmful substances. We are at real risk if we continue in this way. Climate change only being one of them as, as a danger. Physiologically, the species could go well, in a retrograde fashion, you know, like the planets do. Thank you. Um, uh, that, that's a wonderful answer. Um, I, um, I'm very intrigued by um, creativity as, uh, as well, uh, having taught some courses uh, on it. And um, I, I'd, I'd love to revisit the, the topic um, later. Um, uh, uh, Minister Angelovska, um, what, what, what's your... Um, I guess, first take on the question, are we at an evolutionary moment? Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's, uh, it's difficult to add on to all this that has been said already. I, when you asked, are we at the evolutionary moment, and if we are positive about it or optimistic about it, uh, I consider myself an eternal optimist, but with a dose of realism that after being for 10 years in the private sector and now for a year in the ministry and in, uh, for the first time in the public sector, I think that this dose of realism has increased. I wouldn't say pessimism, but this dose of realism on top of the optimism has increased significantly. And I believe that it all depends on people. We have been speaking, um, we heard the professor speaking about uh, the, the problems and uh, how solving problems is actually there isn't any, there is no possible evolution without solving problems that are out there. It's just that people and nations and countries and leaders decide what problems are we going to solve and how this solving of the problems will bring us and in what direction and where we will go. There is no doubt that, as the president said, that we are in the speeding up uh, process of uh, making this change, of evolving, we are constantly evolving. It's just that we all agree with that the speed is unprecedented compared to the evolution in, in previous years and in centuries and in thousands of years. Everything's packed in a, in a, in a page that was used to be in a book of a thousand pages. Uh, but it's just that I'm not sure that the direction that we are headed, the speed is there, but it's just, just the direction that we are headed. I'm not sure if we will take the right road. There is technology. We were speaking about AI and we are becoming one with technology. Uh, we 
technology is amazing, can do amazing things, can contribute uh, to aging, to health. We see the companies like Neuralink of Elon Musk and other uh, genetic opportunities that are out there. It's all about health tech, insurance tech, uh, you know, everything connected to tech and we are becoming one with technology. But it's just that uh, technology can be used for good to solve problems that are good for our population and can be used also for bad. We've seen that uh, with like master manipulation of the nations that are being done by technologies. And imagine, for instance, if the case of Cambridge Analytica, which we have already seen, was used to actually brain hack or mindset hack our nations, but for good of the planet and for changing our mindset, how we think about uh, the environment, how we think about people into making us better uh, better persons and making this world better for living. So I will uh, stop for now and I think that there is a lot to be said. I definitely hope that I will remain positive. It will depend and everything depends in, on people where we will get to, how we will get to. Uh, and uh, I am optimistic still that we will take the right way and the right direction. Thank, thanks very much. Um, We've been uh, now joined by Francisco Sanchez, uh, uh, former Secretary, uh, Under Secretary of Commerce for the United States and Chairman of CNS Global uh, Consulting. Um, Pat, thanks for uh, joining. Your timing's impeccable. Um, we um, we were just doing a first round uh, on the question. Uh, do, do you know what, what's your first stab at the uh, the question? Are we living at this uh, evolutionary moment here in 2020 that seems a little bit like a a science fiction year, both, both good and bad. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. I uh, first of all, I apologize for being late. I, uh, as I was hearing my fellow panelists, uh, I was uh, fighting with technology to get into the panel, um, but it looks like uh, I finally made it. Um, I, I, as I listened to my fellow panelists, I. Uh, I, I find myself agreeing with a lot of what was said in that um, we, we live in, a, in an extraordinary time where technology, uh, I'm optimistic that technology will take us uh, in positive directions, but I'm cautiously optimistic uh, because um, I, I have concerns and fears that um, some things that uh, technology can do can um, hurt us, hurt us as a planet, hurt us uh, as a people, um, hurt us as nations. Um, but I think on the whole, uh, I see positive outcomes in terms of nutrition, in terms of sustainability, in the way that we're trying to apply uh, technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's uh, the use of uh, electric vehicles, whether it's uh, reducing um, packaging in, in, in products. So I, uh, while I have some concerns, I remain a, an optimist that we are at a moment, uh, an inflection point, if you will, uh, that's moving us in a direction for good. Um, and uh, I am, I'm hopeful that, uh, that I'm right. Wonderful. Well, um, I tend to agree, even though I, I think things may uh, unravel a little bit more. Um, they say uh, um, the the old analogy was it's uh, darkest before the dawn. And um, uh, I had a, a Zen master teacher who used to say in a very Yoda like fashion, a, um, a good situation is a bad situation and a bad situation is a good situation, Benjamin. Uh, so I always try and remember that. Um, well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, perhaps we can sort of unpackage some of the, the thoughts. Um, first of all, um, I wonder what your prognosis for the global economy is. Um, are we at some sort of inflection point here? Um, clearly, many countries this year have suffered from uh, uh, unprecedented recession I, I think in the looking at the UK data it was the worst in 150 years at one point um, and do you think uh, over the coming couple of years this could be a catalyst 
there's something bigger, bigger change, perhaps a new Bretton Woods. Um, or, or uh, of course, there are the fans of decentralized te technologies, the libertarians who think that central banks uh, and uh, and policymakers can't really uh, cope with the complexity of the the global economy now and think that blockchain and Bitcoin uh, is, is the answer. But uh, just um, any any sense uh, uh, of where you think the the, the global economy uh, may, may be going in uh, in um, yeah, um, uh, Professor Mabubani, would you like to um, have a stab at that in the context of your expertise on geopolitics? Uh, well, I would say, frankly, uh, it's very difficult at this stage to make any comfortable or confident predictions. Uh, about global the global economy because we are still in the thick of battle against COVID-19. It's not over yet. And as you know, when you're in the thick of battle, uh, you are surrounded by what they call the fog of war. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's so, for example, we don't even know, no one, no one knows, I think, when exactly a, a working vaccine will be available and when exactly we can start flying uh, for a start comfortably around the world. So we don't know that, but so it could be in the next uh, year or so, we might still be in some kind of global doldrums. But beyond that, I remain, like many of our other panelists, fundamentally optimistic. And here I want to say that it's, if you look at China, for example, and if China is by any chance a leading indicator of what can happen to an economy, after COVID-19, China is seeing an incredible V-shaped recovery. It will be the only major economy that will enjoy positive growth this year. We still don't know how much, three, five, whatever it is, percent. And if you go to China, I haven't got, but my, my friends are there. They say that if you go to Shanghai or Beijing, you can't get a seat in a restaurant. <laughs> fully booked. Uh, you, uh, people are moving around. Uh, life is almost uh, back to normal. Internal flights are about 70% full. Uh, of course, the international flights are still empty. Uh, so you, you've seen a remarkable rebound in China, but that's, of course, but that, that's also part of the long-term trajectory of China coming back, as I mentioned earlier, after having gone to sleep for 200 years, it, it's woken up now. And so that's why this you get this tremendous bounce back in, in, in China. But overall, I would say uh, what, what is definitely happen, happening is that for the next decade or so, the, the main growth is going to come from East Asia. Yeah. A combination, China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and all that. That, that. This will be the main growth engine of global growth. It's very clear. And if they can continue on a positive trajectory, then I think once we turn the corner around COVID-19, I expect global growth to come back again. Oh, thank you, thank you. I tend to tend to to agree, um, uh, particularly on the points about East Asia. Um, I've uh, been based in the UK during lockdown, so um, that might have been influencing my psychology at the moment. But I, I'm hearing the same uh, anecdotes um, uh, out of China as well. Uh, Madam President, how, how do you think uh, about the global economy for, for the next decade? The way things are going, I get the impression that both the wealth divide uh, and the digital divide is, is going to just become wider than it is now. Uh, years ago, there was already, uh, there have been several UN conferences on the digital divide. Uh, we have seen fantastic progress in, uh, in advanced countries. Uh, the use of the cell phones uh, in very remote regions of Africa or India also have had a fantastic economical impact. Nevertheless, the Gini index in most countries keeps increasing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot imagine it going on forever uh, uh, without wealth being unduly concentrated in so few hands that those few hands will obviously be tempted uh, to use wealth for what it's usually used for, and that is power. So that if we had before uh, wars and, 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 and power status established in terms of 
number of inhabitants, uh, size of the territory, uh, resources to natural access to natural resources, either your own or uh, the ability to get them from somebody else. Um, population growth as such, I think, is going to be an important factor. Africa uh, is filling up with younger and younger people. These populations uh, will have to somehow not just be fed uh, in order to survive, uh, but how are they going to find the dignity, uh, the sense of self-worth uh, that basically work gives to most people? I know that uh, there have been always social classes that have made made it a point of their existence to show how uh, leisurely uh, they can be. Uh, the British upper class has always uh, considered that you're not a lady or a gentleman if you ever have to use your hands for anything, uh, certainly not for surviving. Uh, but in most uh, of the world, having some meaning in life is given by what you do and who you are. And uh, as populations increase and automation takes over, and some countries uh, more advanced in technology or resources uh, take over from others, what will happen, say, they, the power shift goes to Asia? What happens to Africa? What happens to South America? What do these people do? Uh, I'm a bit worried about the ability uh, of our uh, of our planet to somehow have an equitable distribution of the available resources when we can't even manage to do it within separate countries. Even de so supposedly democratic countries have huge indices of disequality between those who have and those who have not. The United States is a famous example of that. How long can this go on without some of the masses having not a Marxist revolution, but something else, the masses at some point will start protesting. I think you make e excellent uh, points. Uh, I think it's one of the greatest crises uh, of our time, and particularly as a, a Westerner who's lived half my life in Asia, half in in, in Europe, um, I, I, I'm particularly concerned about the Gini coefficients in, in, in the West. Uh, thank, thank you, um, Minister Angelovska. Uh, how, how are you looking at the global economy? Uh, I would first maybe comment on the on the numbers about the global economy, and then I would like to connect to the what the president has said uh, regarding the digital skills uh, and the digital divide, which is a topic that is very close to my heart. I would say. Uh, I think that it's uh, this forecast that have been done for the global economy have been the most difficult ones due to the uh, unknown trajectory of the crisis. What the professor has mentioned about the V-shaped curve is I think China will be and is the only country that will experience this V-shaped curve while the global economy, uh, IMF revised for instance its uh, projections for several times, it uh, were first in April with, um, for instance, uh, 3%, then they increase it for roughly around 2%. So now the global economy is expected to shrink by 4.9%. Uh, uh, while EU has been also revising the numbers and is expected uh, to go uh, to shrink by 7.5% in 2020. And then the recovery or the growth is expected to be 6% in 2021 when it comes to to the global economy and to the to EU, of course. Uh, so I think that uh, definitely this is the greatest opportunity. This crisis, as uh, Winston Churchill said, never let a crisis go to waste. I think that this is the greatest opportunity that we have to bridge and to decrease actually the digital divide, to increase the digital skills of our nations. We see a spike increase in e-commerce, in digital tools, in people getting um, e-banking, paying digitally. And I think that now there will be never an opportunity like this for technologies and for people to get on board with technologies. However, one of the uh, problems is actually the low digital skills, the very basic uh, digital skills um, of the nation. Generally speaking, if we're speaking about the third world countries or even 
developing countries, North Macedonia, I'm not very proud to say, but we have very low digital skills, which is actually the obstacle for going into using the benefits, exploiting the benefits of the digital economy. So now we have this opportunity to increase the digital skills. EU has been putting a uh, um, great deal of the resources to increasing the digital skills, uh, especially in the older population, because today is like not knowing to send an email is like not knowing to read and write. And this is actually a big, big problem for Europe and for the world. And I think that we are now at the turning point to use this period while it lasts and to get people on board to learn them at least the basic digital skills. However, it's not very easy. We've been struggling and trying. I've been working uh, with the e-commerce association and with, with European as, uh, associations and with the UN uh, for, for the digital skills uh, of, of the developing world and the emerging uh, countries, but it's going very, very slowly. So we need to speed up this urgently. And, and the other problem that we are discussing about is the um, requalification uh, and upskilling of people and this will become more and more difficult to do you know it is uh, it as as we the new world is asking for new set of skills new ways of thinking and it will be very difficult to reskill or to upskill or to requalify for instance a truck driver who tomorrow will be replaced by autonomous uh, driving and make him a software engineering this is like uh, on a scale of one to hundred, this is a hundred heavy comparing, comparing to, you know, making an administrator, uh, that will be replaced or a sales agent or a customer care who will be replaced by a robot and giving him something else that is connected to technology. So I think this will become a main problem. And this, that's why we are speaking, the world is speaking about, um, finding ways to requalify people to upskill them as soon as possible but maybe who knows nations will need to think about some sort of extending the social safety net and getting these people with a, some sort of unified income i think that harari has been speaking about this uh, in his in his books and of where our nations will go but definitely we have to use this opportunity that covid is uh, offering at the moment and hopefully we won't return because, you know, systems and people have the natural tendency to return to the previous normal where the comfort zone was. So the new normal of COVID has not become our comfort zone yet. So if this crisis lasts for a bit, it will become our comfort zone. And I hope people will not go back to where they were in terms of the skills and what they have learned and how they embrace technologies and digitalization. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the remarks. Um, we had a comment um, from uh, Adam Jacoby saying that uh, blockchain is is not about libertarianism. It's the recognition that the existing system perpetuates uh, inequality. Going back to um, Madam President's uh, comments, uh, I'm uh, as an ex uh, uh, investor, hedge fund uh, manager. I'm, I'm quite concerned about um, all of the. Um, uh, printing that's uh, happened by uh, central banks around the world is, is another factor that could perpetuate this uh, um, uh, gap, uh, worsening of Gini coefficients uh, around the world. Um, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Sanchez, what, 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 um, how are you thinking about the um, the, the global economy, and um, um, do do you think there's a, a place for um, technologies like blockchain? Um, if we have to reconsider the, the the global financial system, uh, could there be a, a Bretton another Bretton Woods uh, uh, in the next few years? Um, well, if if I may first uh, comment on on the the broader question that you asked on where is the economy heading, and then I'll talk about that. I think in the near term, how how countries handle uh, the pandemic. Uh, and second waves, if they have them, uh, will determine how quickly there is a recovery. In China, they seem to have been able to manage this process uh, quite well. And, and I think that's the most important thing. Uh, unfortunately, in my own country, in the United States, uh, I don't think we've done a very good job. 
Um, and I fear that uh, we're still not doing a good job. And so the first order of business is to make sure we're doing everything we can to get past this. And if, and if countries around the world can do that, I think that, that the numbers may change, uh, in, in the, in the short term. In the longer term, um, again, I, I'm going to, uh, take an optimistic note. Uh, I think there's going to be very much disruptive technologies. Blockchain may well be one of them. Um, and we may see a, a, a new way of how we, uh, pay for things, uh, how supply chains, uh, are managed through blockchain. But I, I see five areas with significant disruption. Um, but disruption that could actually be, uh, positive to deal with the, the problems that Madam President raised about, um, inequality. And those five areas are information, energy, food, uh, transportation, uh, and materials cost. I see disruptions that will bring the cost in all these areas substantially down. Um, and as we see these dis- disruptions, my hope is that um, it also has uh, a positive effect on inequality, bringing these costs down. We've seen in Africa the use of technology uh, leapfrogging the way that um, that banking is done, for example, using fintech in ways that are even faster than some uh, advanced nations. So I, um, I, I think that the, the two uh, problems that were identified by Madam President, Madam Minister, that is inequality and being able to transfer uh, to a different set of skills will, will be the change that will be the most difficult uh, challenges that we have as we see these uh, disruptions take hold. I think we can see them in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and I remain optimistic that those disruptions and, and the reduction in cost that we'll see in those five key areas will make it easier uh, both to manage the challenges we've had with inequality and help people transition to a different skill set needed uh, when these disruptions take hold. Thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps we can move um, into um, the, the next round. Um, the, 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 I guess the broad question is, um, what do we think about our geopolitical uh, future? What's the, what's the, the future of international um, uh, cooperation uh, uh, and, um, and even the future of the nation state? Uh, are we moving to a, a world where um, that cities, perhaps uh, regions, become more important, uh, or do in, uh, super international bodies like the United Nations need uh, need to be given uh, more power? Um, and 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 uh, I'm guessing that uh, Professor uh, Mababani might want to also touch on: uh, Are we um, moving into the um, Eurasian or, or Chinese century? Given that uh, you've just written a book, uh, has China already won? Um, uh, uh, and, um, what does that mean? Um, so, so, so this round's really ab- about, um, I'm trying to keep it broad so we can, um, sort of expand our minds. That was the goal of the, of this session, but, um, perhaps professor, um, you could kick off. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for mentioning my book. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, we are also, and I should have, I guess, when I, when I mentioned the three big turning points in my opening remarks, the fourth big turning point, of course, is that we are now clearly entered, uh, the, probably the biggest geopolitical contest since human history began because it's the scale, the scale of the powers. I mean, the United States, as you know, has accumulated more power than any other country has ever in human history. And similarly, China today is uh, on the verge of uh, surpassing the United States, at least in terms of the size of its economy. Uh, Certainly in PPP terms, it's done so already within nominal terms, could happen within 10 to 15 years. And so this contest, therefore, is of 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 a tremendous scale uh, between the United States and China. And and, in, and the goal of my book is to actually to try and prevent this U.S.-China geopolitical contest getting out of control 
but it is getting out of control in some significant ways because it's driven by three structural forces. And it's important to understand the structural forces because then you understand why even COVID-19 couldn't stop it. Because in theory, uh, you know, this is an old, another old rule of geopolitics. In World War II, when Winston Churchill decided his enemy number one was Hitler, Stalin, the general title ruler, became an ally of Winston Churchill. Mm. The enemy of your enemy is your friend. So in COVID-19, is an enemy of United States. COVID-19 is an enemy of China. United States and China should have actually even temporarily paused the geopolitical contest and say, let's fight COVID-19 together. Didn't happen. The fact it didn't happen showed how powerful the structural forces are that are moving this U.S.-China geopolitical contest. And the three, three structural forces are, number one, Graham Allison has documented this in his book, Destined for War. Whenever the world's number one emerging power is China, it's about overthink the world's number one power. The world's number one power always pushes down the world's number one emerging power. It's happened for 2,000 years. So it's natural behavior on the part of the United States. The second structural force, and, and this is something no one talks about, which is because it is politically incorrect, which also explains the emotionalism of the U.S.-China geopolitical contest, which is that there's a, there has been a fear of the yellow peril in the Western psyche. And that yellow peril is coming out in, in, in many different different ways in response to the uh, what's happening today. And when you start calling the China virus, the Wuhan virus, the Kung flu, you can see the, the sort of yellow peril dimension coming out in these statements. And then the third structural force, of course, is that the United States had expected and by in a bipartisan way that when China emerge after China, after U.S. opened up China economically, China would open up politically, China would become a liberal democracy, and U.S. and China would live happily ever after. It didn't happen. <laughs> China didn't become a liberal democracy. And that's why in, in the United States today, even though it's divided on virtually everything, when it comes to China, there's a bipartisan consensus. We must stand up to China. So whether it's Trump, whether it's Biden, the geopolitical contest will continue between U.S. and China. So you can see that this U.S.-China geopolitical contest is very serious and, and something that we have to deal with. By the same time, just to balance what I said, that, you know, if, if you have 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, and if you take out 1.7 billion of US and China, that still leaves 6 billion people in the rest of the world. And the 6 billion people in the world, if you ask them, where do you stand on the US China job contest? There's almost a universal consensus. Hey, we got bigger things to deal with now. We got COVID-19 to deal with. We got global warming to deal with. We've got the inequality problems that uh, Madam President spoke about. Uh, you have uh, global poverty coming back again after COVID-19. So we have incredible challenges. Why are we focused on this geopolitical contest? So I hope that, and this is why forums like this are very important because forums like this that bring in voices from the rest of the world, the rest of the world, mm -hmm. if possible, should speak in a united fashion to both United States and China and say, please stop this contest. There are far bigger mm -hmm. issues at stake now than what you were the mm -hmm. zero sum game that you're playing, which is a 19th century geopolitical game. And as I said, now that now that all 7.7 .7 billion of us now live on the same boat, right? And, you know, if you're, if you're on the same boat, for example, if a fire breaks out, the first thing you do is put out the fire and you don't say who started the fire. Don't have an argument. But that's what happened in COVID-19. United States and China began arguing about who started the fire. That's, that's irrational behavior. So I hope that the remaining six billion of us would sort of speak out more loudly. And that's also the goal. One reason why I wrote the book, the rest of us must speak with a louder and stronger voice to the United States and China and say, hey, we have serious global challenges. Let's focus on them first. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, um, I'm being. Um, I was assured that uh, this session we could extend because um, we were only penciled in for 45 minutes on the itinerary. But I was assured by Frank that we could extend uh, up up to 60 minutes or, or so, and that uh, um, most of the panelists have, have agreed. Um, so hopefully the technology is not going to cut us off because my screen is saying uh, time is up to uh, 19 seconds left. So uh, I'm going to assume that uh, we can carry on and uh, apologies uh, to the audience if um, the technology fails us. But um, um, thank you very much, um, Professor Mababani. Um, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. Um, uh, Madam President, what... Um, uh, what what what's your view uh, on the the sort of broader geopolitical situation? 
Well, it just so happens that uh, we have been celebrating these past days the 75th anniversary of the creation of what was could have been uh, a sort of a the beginning of of a world governance. Uh, not not one dominated by one country or two in in conflict or, or three or four or five, uh, but <laughs> that very body you see does still have an antiquated structure where five countries uh, have special say about world security uh, and the others look on. Uh, when we look at other international bodies, like the World Health Organization, when it is convenient for a country to be a member of it, uh, then they will uh, re remain there. But as we saw with uh, President Trump, uh, if he thinks he's hit a vein uh, where of populism, uh, which would uh, give him support in his own country, uh, he will happily uh, draw out his country from it. And so on it goes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in the world, uh, it is not the United Nations that has really been dictating what happens. It has been nation states. Uh, there has been a divide between those who do have nuclear arms and those who do not, by whatever means acquired. Uh, the uh, cities and the regions have been doing a lot of creative work. Uh, I can think of a, a number of cities, uh, which, by the way, are bigger than, than many a country uh, that's member of the United Nations, including my own, um, mega cities uh, that uh, have become entities uh, equivalent uh, to states, uh, nation states uh, that are smaller uh, and have taken remarkable initiatives and, and, and creative solutions. I know that uh, within a city like Sao Paulo, uh, there are actually districts. There are uh, supposedly the kind of districts where the police wouldn't even set foot because, uh, if you like, civilization had disappeared from them in the usual sense that you would expect it uh, in a modern city. And the local inhabitants, with, of course, some creative individuals leading them, have created, uh, in that uh, particular instance, for instance, streets that are considerably safer to walk on uh, than they had been for decades. Uh, regions, regions do have a common interest that are simply dictated by geography, by proximity, um, by, by the uh, climate uh, that's available to them, uh, the, the level of education of their average population, etc., etc. All these are positive signs, but in order to come to something truly world coordinated, uh, who is going to deal with that continent wide, um, floating mass of garbage in the, in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean? Well, it seems that non governmental organizations are taking up the fight. We don't see blue helmets going out there fishing out the garbage, uh, that's killing the whales and many other species. Um, we have non-governmental bodies, so that, uh, if you like, <laughs> there's a lot going on, much of it positive, but a lot of it negative. And uh, as usual, uh, it's going to be an interaction between these various forces. And frankly, in any one area, things could go well, and they could just as easily go ill. But the good news is that human beings do have a fantastic power for creativity and a fantastic power for problem solving. And when correctly applied, it, it can do absolute marvels. Thank you. Um, uh, Secretary Sanchez, um, what, what's, what's your view on the uh, geopolitical situation and future and opportunities even? Um, uh, let, me, let me first uh, start with the U.S.-China uh, relationship. Uh, it, in my country right now, and, and uh, some of the comments that the, the professor made uh, really resonate for me uh, when you have leadership in our country that tries to blame the pandemic on one country and, and try to, in many ways, try to avoid responsibility for how we've managed that. Uh, it's not helpful. It's not helpful within our country. It's not helpful within the world community. 
the U.S.-China relationship is probably the most complex geopolitical relationship that exists today and, and will remain the most complicated uh, relationship going forward. Um, and it, I have to hope that, that we have leadership in this country as well as leadership in China that will find a way to manage that complexity. And what do I mean by that? We're going to be competitors. We're going to be fierce competitors, the United States and China. Um, but we have to find ways to cooperate on important issues that affect not only our two countries, but the world. Even at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States found ways to cooperate uh, on a number of fronts. And the same has to happen in in this relationship. Now, this idea of whether we're going to have or we're going to continue to have big nations or we're going to move away from nation states and 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 create some other way i don't know that it's going to it's going to be that way i think it's going to be a combination of things um uh w one of the things that i uh love uh, that's happened uh is the uh the the well, as the madam president mentioned uh nonprofit organizations are cleaning the ocean well nonprofit organizations are also shining a light on things that um uh, that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have happening in the world. So for, forced labor, child labor, um, that wasn't initially changed by governments, but it was changed by non uh, NGOs shining a light, and all of a sudden corporations saying, "I can't have my reputation tarnished um, by that." So it was, it was, it was not government action at first, but it was uh, people taking uh, initiative. And I think as we go forward, uh, you're still going to have nations that hopefully will act responsibly, will find ways to cooperate. But increasingly, increasingly, I think you'll find individuals, uh, nonprofit organizations playing an important role in having a positive impact in the future. Thank you, uh, Secretary. Um, so um, in the interest of, um, of time, I think we'll... Um, Thankfully, the uh, technology hasn't c cut us off. So um, I propose we do one last um, round. Um, I know um, Minister Angelovska has to leave us first. So I did have a few other questions. But um, if you have any sort of um, uh, we've we've touched on technology. I, I, I did have a specific question on, on technology. And uh, secondly, um, I wondered what the panel thought about um, the ecological crisis and whether they were optimistic. But um, um, with those two questions lurking in the background, uh, I, I wonder whether you have any uh, final thoughts. But of course, the ecology or the climate crisis is um, a, a, a key crisis we're, we're facing and, and will require um, global cooperation. So wondering whether you're uh, op optimistic there and um, um, and again, um, uh, you know, it, is this an evolutionary moment or, um, or, or not? Uh, I think that we have to be optimistic. I, I have never actually been on a more optimistic panel. Everybody is uh, feeling uh, good and optimistic about the future, which is good that so we are different countries here who have uh, different backgrounds, different age, who have actually agreed that the future is optimistic. I think that uh, collaboration that has been uh, touched upon uh, in the previous question is something that is key and will become more and more important for, for the development of the world. And another thing um, is that I think that the future is global. It's all about globalization. We should look at it positively. I think we should embrace it and not try to, of course, there are negative sides of each thing, but I think that we should be positive about it, especially uh, we will in, in the road that we will uh, go undergo and uh, that we will have to tackle many, many challenges that globalization brings. One thing that was not mentioned that I would add for, for the end is that um, there is no doubt that nowadays with great speed uh, goods and manufacturing and uh, services and everything travels in a second, um, we don't even know the country of origin, where it has been manufactured, where value has been added. 
And one of the key discussions um, that is collaboration very much needed is, and I know that for three years a consensus cannot be found, is uh, where the value was created and where this good or service should be taxed. So this is a, a very, very uh, valid and important discussion if we want to move forward. Uh, we've been discussing at uh, OSCD and all these international organizations uh, about how countries will agree to treat on what and where uh, the value was, was added. Because now we have user generated, users generate the value actually, and for a company to be based and to be creating value in the country, it doesn't have to have infrastructure or investments. We have seen that international investments are skyrocketing and now the investment doesn't even have to be in buildings and infrastructure. So I think that this is a valid question to ask and I do hope that collaboration will flourish and that we will find a consensus on this so that uh, so that we can progress in that in that area. In terms of the, the, the green economy, the ecological crisis, I think that this is a very important question, especially now because while COVID has been causing substantial economic and social shocks, production, consumption and employment have been dropping, but these have also been actually associated with the, the reduction and the drop in pollution and in greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Air quality has improved in a few months for something that we have been aiming and hoping for a few few years to happen. Uh, we know that traffic has dropped. The, the professor mentioned that it hasn't in China, but international traffic, air traffic and all uh, and ground traffic has dropped. Factories have been closed. However, uh, this is not uh, also positive. Uh, if we take a look at the incredible waste levels that have increased due to the shocks in the agri uh, to, uh, in the agri industry, uh, there is an increase in organic waste and there are many, many other not so positive effects. So I think that uh, as we have been speaking, just to conclude and to finish, we have been speaking, there is no evolution and progress without problems. I think this is a problem for our planet and I do hope that the mindset of our nations will awaken because in developing countries, in countries that I have that I live in and uh, the neighboring countries in the in the uh, LDCs and in all of these poorer societies and countries, the mindset and the awareness is not, is not there yet. Uh, the developed countries, the richer countries, yes, there is the the mindset and the awareness about plastic, about what it does to our planet. But I think that uh, we still have a long a way to go here. We need to increase the awareness and make the problem more out there. And I do hope that now this social media and technology will help us improve for, for better. So uh, thank you uh, for for uh, uh, being part of the panel. It was it was a pleasure. In case I'm so sorry that I have to leave in a few minutes, I hope I will be able to stay and listen to all the, the participants until the end. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure, and um, I wish you all to continue with the, with the optimism uh, in striving to make this world a better place. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, um, a real pleasure. Um, Ma Ma Madam President, um, um, the Minister said uh, she's never been on such a, an optimistic panel. Uh, Perhaps it's my uh, fault for framing it in in such a way, and or, or maybe it's a time frame issue. Uh, are you um, how positive are you really? And um, in, in your final remarks, and um, um, about, do you see uh, many uh, short term risks? Of course, uh, in your opening comments, you, you said you were very concerned about uh, whether we can really. Um, use technology in a creative way and, and not over rely on it and of course you mentioned that the uh the gini coefficients uh continue to go north and and wealth disparities uh, are likely to worsen 
we had uh, we had a question uh, from uh, Adam Jacoby about uh, the uh, distinction I made between biological evolution and cultural. I just like to clarify that by culture I don't mean just tiptoeing around in ballet uh, and dancing and singing and and so on. I, uh, by culture I mean everything that is created by humans. Um, uh, including technology uh, and, and politics and, and you name it, uh, everything that is uh, just not biologically natural born. And that's a very broad, broad concept. Um, we do live uh, in uh, uh, on a planet that's evolved in an incredibly uh, complex way. And, and you mentioned at the beginning that there is a complexity complexification going on and uh, I remember uh, uh, there was a famous uh, Nobel Prize in physics but a wonderful article I used to give to my students about the increasing levels of complexity as you go up uh, from the molecular level uh, for instance, so two molecules of air, hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen floating around um, is, is nothing special. Uh, when they join together to form H2O, uh, it acquires um, unprecedented qualities uh, that uh, you could not imagine before, but it just so happened, you know, by a happy accident, it seems, uh, that they have allowed for life to develop on our planet. Uh, because uh, H2O can be uh, can take uh, a liquid form, uh, it can evaporate, it can become a gas or a vapor, uh, it can take a crystalline form, it can solidify, and just by a happy accident, it so happens that this crystalline form, the ice, uh, is lighter than the H2O in its liquid form. And this is why uh, in our northern climates, uh, we have uh, fish surviving both in the in the sea and uh, and in inland water and so on and so on. Uh, then the next jump up to life uh, and so on and so forth. So that complexification of nature is part certainly of human nature. What is uh, alarming to me, and I'm not that optimistic about it, is are the depredations that the one species that happens to have this hypertrophied. Uh, extremely developed uh, cerebral cortex uh, has imposed on the other species on this planet. Uh, the rate at which species disappear from the Earth uh, keeps accelerating. Uh, it's just like the Gini index for wealth concentration. Uh, human beings are concentrating all the resources of the planet. They're taking over the habitats of more and more different species. They're destroying ecosystems like the Amazon that have taken possibly millions of years to develop, such as they were, and uh, you can burn them down uh, in a few days. It will give you three years of, of better yields of crops, and after that uh, it's slash and burn again because it will take maybe a million years for it all to grow back the way it was before, certainly hundreds of years before it develops. So that I think uh, people are becoming, if people become more educated about their place in nature, as well as their place in society, as we become more sophisticated as, uh, as to what technological advances mean. And especially, I think, that nowadays they are teaching children in school about the financial system, because 2008, to my understanding, showed that the whole thing is just a lot of flimflam. I mean, you have the Bretton Woods in the, uh, institutions and, and you have Federal Reserve Bank and so on and so on. And then it turns out that, that teachers, unions and, and, and all sorts of uh, social bodies uh, who had invested in the respectable banks, which used to be known because of the of the brass bars that the tellers had in front of their cages and so on, and the safes that they, were, they carried the wealth in. And it turns out that they have invested into increasingly empty packages of investment, and when you unpackage them, there's nothing inside. And this sort of template, uh, well, I hope that you have been mentioning blockchain and, and systems like that, uh, all I can say as uh, somebody who's not uh, truly versed in finance, I hope that it is 
a better sort of flim flam than what what we have this business of banks just printing money and increasing debt theoretically but who would ever pay it thank thank you very much madam president for your comments um uh, secretary sanchez do you, um would you like to respond to any any of those uh comments and um uh, and and make any concluding remarks well um uh... I, I think that as we go forward, I'm, I'm still going to close with what I started, which is I'm optimistic that uh, with the technology that I see on the horizon, with the, uh, the awareness uh, around the world of having to confront issues that face us all, um, I'm optimistic that we will move forward in a positive way. Having said that and acknowledging what Madam President uh, has said, um, we're probably going to take two steps forward and one step back as we go as we go and apply uh, technology as we try to work better as as individuals and as countries. Um, but I see lights of optimism, and uh, I think technology is going to be important, whether it's through information, whether it's through advances in sustainable agriculture. Um, whether it's advances in transportation. Um, so uh, I, uh, I will take the two steps forward, recognizing that we'll take two steps backwards uh, or one step backward as we take two steps forward. I, I hope that we have leadership uh, um, in nations, uh, in communities that can help uh, the world move forward. And when we don't have those leaders, um, that we do what we need to do um, to change them. And if we can do that, if we can find cooperation, if we can use um, all the positive that can come from the technology that is before us, um, in spite of some of the setbacks that we'll probably uh, experience, um, I'm optimistic about the future. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I believe the um, the collapse in biodiversity um as um madam president uh, um touched upon is it, is something that uh, we somewhat overlook um in our uh, in our focus on uh, just climate change um I, I think um the environmental situation um really needs to be looked at in a in a very holistic uh, manner um uh well the la i guess the last comment uh, goes to you uh, professor um what uh, what's your sort of final take on this uh well i'm very glad that i've joined such an optimistic panel <laughs> and i i must say personally i completely share that optimism and if i look at my own life when i grew up as a child in singapore singapore is a poor developing country the upper capita income was 500 dollars, the same as ghana uh, at that time i was put in a special feeding program and i was six years old because i was technically undernourished I didn't have a flush toilet and, you know, we didn't have any modern amenities, no television, no refrigerator and all that. And now look at Singapore today. <laughs> so I've, in a sense, traveled several generations in my life. And in, in and so as a result of that, when I look back, as, especially look at the, uh, Asia overall, I mean, uh, when I was ambassador to the UN in the year 2000 with Kofi Annan, the uh, UN set some Millennium Development Goals to reduce uh, global poverty by half and succeeded by 2015, you know. So we have done, we've made some incredible leaps uh, uh, moving forward. And I think the human condition will continue to improve. But I want to end with what I call a silver bullet solution, which I think can really, really help our world. Because going back to my very first point, which is that we are now on the same boat stuck in different cabins on the same boat. We just can't take care of our cabins. We've got to take care of the global boat as a whole. And, of course, trying to create the institutions of global governance from start is almost impossible, very, very difficult. But luckily for us, the United States and the West gifted us some very, very good institutions, and, and UN, the UN family is that. So the question is, why is the United Nations so weak? Now, I serve as ambassador to the UN for over 10 years. The UN is not weak by accident, it's weak by design, right? It's been kept weak and in two ways. Number one, if you want to become, uh, I'll be very blunt, please forgive me. Uh, if you want to become the Secretary General of the UN, 
and you are dynamic, visionary, hardworking, driven, and you know how to save the world, you're disqualified. Because the five uh, five hundred members want somebody who's spineless, whom they can manipulate. And sad, you know, some escape that. Huh? I mean, Kofi Annan escaped that. Kaban Ki Moon escaped that in some ways. So you can escape that. But that's how their selection process is made. Now, you you didn't mind weak governance if you're not on the same boat. But now that you're on the same boat, it's now interest to strengthen existing institutions of uh, global governance. So you can make a switch and say, from now on, when I select the UN Secretary General, I'll not pick someone dynamic and driven. Not That's not the weakest possible candidate no. I can find. And the second point is that, and here again, um, forgive my bluntness. The, the the way the World Health Organization has been kept weak is that in the 1970s, over 60% of the budget of the World Health Organization came from mandatory compulsory contributions. You can only make long-term plans on the basis of mandatory compulsory contributions. Now that share has gone down from 60% to 18%, less than one-fifth. How can any organization work out a long-term future if 82% of your contributions are voluntary, can change every year. So you're killing the organization. So if you can restore the funding of World Health Organization, of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I can go I can go on a long list, bring it up again by mandatory contributions are, are, are much higher, then these organizations become stronger uh, institutionally. And so in a world where we need stronger institutions, and so and we can, and the, the remarkable thing is that we can, with one switch of policy, uh, help to deal with all the problems, biodiversity, global warming, COVID-19, all these global challenges, if you strengthen uh, institutions of global governance. And, and, and fortunately for us, we've been, we've been guided by a wrong policy, and if we can change this policy, this is what I call my silver bullet solution, then you see we'll end up in stronger institutions of global governance, and we can begin to tackle many of these problems that we have. So I hope that one small uh, solution will be accepted in due course by the world. Thanks very much, Professor. And um, uh, thanks uh, to all of the panel for uh, spending a little bit of extra time uh, uh, today. Um, I, um, I think it's been an upbeat, uh, fairly optimistic uh, panel, but uh, I don't think anyone is uh, uh, naive uh, here as to the risks uh, uh, in the shorter term. Of course, we haven't even touched uh, upon the some of the imminent risks on the economy and, of course, the U.S. election. Uh, we'll leave that for other panels today to touch on those uh, uh, tricky topics. Uh, but um, uh, I'd like to uh, leave us with the words of um, the uh, the uh, one of the greatest female futurists um, uh, of the last century. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned Barbara Marks Hubbard at the beginning. She said, we are the product of 13.8 billion years of unbroken success. Uh, the offspring of untold generations of procreative victories. Uh, and of course, we have, since the Industrial Revolution, we have caused uh, a lot of uh, d destruction in the last uh, couple of hundred years, as Madam President uh, alluded to. But perhaps uh, it's the, the, the obstacles, the crises that we're facing now uh, uh, is, is the, the catalyst for us to uh, evolve. Uh, and there is... Um, uh, as a futurist, I look at lots of technologies in the pipeline and new systems, new ways of thinking. And when I look at that, when I look at consciousness, when I look at the new stories that are, um, that are emerging, to me, these are the leading indicators. Uh, and although short term, I, I can see a lot of uh, chaos on the horizon. Um, longer term, I think the panel uh, might might well be uh, correct on a, on a 10, 20, 30 year view. Um, thank you. Um, that, for everyone uh, for joining us um obviously um given the caliber of the panel and the, and the vast topic uh, really this should have been a 3 hour panel but i'm not sure everyone would have ma made the time but uh, thank you all thank you thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. thank you very Goodbye, much everyone